My name is Kate Burton. Several years ago, my father, Richard Burton, told a story called Broken Rhymes, a documentary film. An important story about four remarkable people. Four young people who sustained massive brain damage in accidents. At first, they weren't expected to survive. Then there was little hope they would be left with any more than the most primitive consciousness. That they would live their lives in darkened rooms, bodies dying, minds shut down, their lives withering like plants held too long from the sun. But they did survive, these four, more than survive. The film documented their struggle to recover what their accidents had taken away. For each of them, this recovery was a long, terribly difficult journey, from darkness to light, from the abyss to possibility, from death to life. My father told the story of this journey, but then he died before the journey was done, before the tale was fully told. Five years have passed. Perhaps with my help, he can tell it all now. There is a place nearby filled with ghosts and violent echoes and broken rhymes. Like the field of a great battle after the flags have withdrawn and the dead have been carried away. Shortly after the First World War, a Canadian physician wandered the fields of Flanders where so many young men had died to end the war, to end all wars. He wrote, we are the dead Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. This is the carnage of the new Flanders fields. Thousands upon thousands killed in automobiles this year alone. As in a war, mostly the young, and we grieve the loss profoundly. But what of those survivors who were so severely injured that their responses to the world about them would forever be changed. We have learned to mend the body, but what of the brain? That vulnerable, terribly delicate mechanism which lies behind the eyes. What of the mending of the shattered mind? Russell Moody. These scenes were taken when he was 20 about a year after he was severely injured in an automobile accident. For half of that year, he had been in a coma. It seems he was just a shell of what he once had been, that he had lost everything. Speech, mobility, all those processes of mind and memory which define our humanity. But there were some things the accident didn't carry away from the mind of Russell Moody. And as time passed, those remnants of the old personality began to emerge. The long journey back had begun. Three long years of struggle before he would leave the various hospitals where he would mend. Twelve hours a day, seven days a week. He forced himself to exercise to move, to think, to remember, and to anticipate. When we first started a long time ago, do you remember biting me? How many times did you bite me? <laughs> when you couldn't stick out your tongue or move the tongue depressor from side to side? Uh, that was the only that came with a pleasure. A 
a pleasure. It's the only thing you had control over, right? <laughs> Russell, what are some goals you'd like to try and achieve? Mm, um, uh, how? About five years ago, Russell Moody left the hospital. He went out into the real world to see if he could put the pieces of himself together again. He had come so far. Yet, the real journey had just begun. Andy Anderson with more music here on KGBC in Galveston. Five years have passed. Russell Moody rides to his office in the American National Insurance Company in Galveston, Texas. It takes him nearly half an hour to walk from the parking garage to the elevators and then to his office. But he walks on his own. As he vowed he would every day to a job in a world no one believed he would ever be able to enter. Is your mother? Yes. And since the mother's the owner on this... Policy, His job as an insurance underwriter requires judgment and a quick and steady intelligence. It does not take long in his presence to know he possesses both in abundance. Right, well, let's see here. His deficits remain primarily in the area of mobility and communication. It's very good for Russell to be able to go up there and compete with everybody else and do work uh, in a company because everybody in society works and has their own job and certain things to accomplish. Now, I realize that he, because of his brain injury, he is a little bit slower than the average person. So there, I would, for, I would say that he might contribute 60 to 70 percent of what someone else would do in a day. I would have to say the hardest thing is mentally being able to fight each day after day. Some things have come back to me and there's some things that still haven't come back. And it's also ruined my social life. I used to go out and play sports, take out girls more often, and all that stuff. Now I do very little of it, or none at all. Like most head injury patients, Russell suffers a kind of cruel social exile. Old friends have fallen away. Because of his deficits, new relationships are difficult to establish. And so, the journey from Flanders is a lonely one. He is a solitary traveler through an unfamiliar landscape. After all these years, Russell continues to spend several hours each week learning to speak again. His search for the most advanced therapy has blazed a trail for others to follow. Russell Moody's journey has not been typical. In fact, no two head injury victims ever travel the same path toward recovery. The nature and severity of their injuries are different, infinitely variable. Yet, the distance they travel along the road to recovery how close they can come to normal, productive, independent living depends on four absolutes. The quality of medical care, the financial resources to make this care available, the close, continuing support of the family, the power 
of the individual patient's will. In Russell's case, all four absolutes accompanied him on this journey. So Russell Moody is a symbol of what can be done. Russell kept plugging away, one step at a time. And believe me, those steps were very, very minute for a long time. But he still got better. And he still had the ability and the perseverance to stick in there and not give up. I got this kitchen stuff. At last, a decade after his accident, he moves into his own home where he will live his own life come what may. So we asked what his goals are now. I have to say the best thing in my life was to be able to stand on my own again. Now, I'm looking forward to being able to walk on my own. They have told me it will come, but no time soon. Five or ten years, maybe twenty. So all I can do is wait. Russell Moody will not wait. It's not in his nature. If it takes five years, ten years, twenty years to cast away his canes, it will be the result of a continuing daily, even moment by moment, struggle. And there must be times when he mourns what could have been, when sorrow takes on the hard, sharp edge of anger. Why me? He must wonder. But he goes on relentlessly. His life a monument to discipline and resolve. In Galveston, Texas, there is a place called the Transitional Learning Community where head injury victims like Russell Moody are prepared for independent living. Five years ago, we told the story of two remarkable young men whose journey passed through this unique facility. Carlos Risker had been an inventor, a designer of systems and components for our highest electronic technologies before he was struck down by a bus on a city street. Mark Barton was a high school student, a gifted athlete when he was injured in a fall. Before the accidents, the essential personality of each young man had been a product of the dream he had for his life, to advance science, to excel as an athlete. Now they had to come to grips with the sudden departure of their dreams. The word rehabilitation to me means kind of getting back like you were. But, the, you know, that's kind of, kind of a dream. You know, I, I'll probably never run a hundred yard pickoff back, but there's still a lot of things in life I can do. And I guess rehabilitation in, the, in my sense means making something of your life. At the Transitional Learning Community, Mark and Carlos relearn those ordinary skills of everyday living we all take for granted. Simple things like making do and getting by, paying bills, meeting schedules and responsibilities. But most of all, they work to know this new person they had become, to honor this person, to bestow upon this half-remembered companion esteem and respect. Five years ago, Mark and Carlos left the comfort and safety of the transitional learning community. 
It was, after all, merely a waypoint on their continuing journey. Two young men embark on a voyage more daring than those the distant captains of Atlantis sailed in their ships with painted sails. And they sail for us. For through them we discover once again the almost magical beauty of the individual human life. Godspeed. Five years ago, Mark Barton left the transitional learning community for a life on his own. Yet trouble shadowed his steps like black squalls following a ship at sea. Nothing seemed to work out. Mark Barton discovered that the independence he worked so hard to achieve carried an enormous cost. Independence means you are open to all of life's possibilities, yet vulnerable to all its pain. Five years ago, he was among people who understood what he could do and what he couldn't do, who he had been and who he had become. Now he is back as a gardener. Well, when I left TLC, there were a lot of problems. My friends just kind of went their own way and left me stranded, you know. And I had to kind of make what I was going to do. And a lot of times it wasn't anything. So I didn't do a whole lot, you know. I can't can't drive and it's it's hard to get around and plus where would I go if I did get around you know, I just don't know anybody but I I plan to be here from now on Mark Barton has taken a small step back from total independent living and working because of his deficits he isn't allowed to use sharp cutting tools. He is a gardener, but not quite. It's true, I want to do more. I want to do as much as I can. But I, I realize now that I'm not able to do everything. But I'm going to do what I can all the time. To be a gardener, but not quite. There is a war quietly raging within Mark Barton. Five years ago, his resolve to keep fighting against his deficits was absolute. But now, he is aware of a numbing reality. Before, it was a suspicion, a vague and troubling fear a thing one said, but didn't really believe. Now he knows. He will never be a regular gardener. People are afraid. They don't know what it is. You know, you say head injury, and immediately eyes get bigger. They take a step back. If you were to look at me, on the street, you wouldn't know. I was working with someone last week. They were new, didn't know. That person knew that I walked a little strange, but they didn't know anything was wrong with me. I don't know if I'll tell them or not. I need to get out need to get around more people. I just have I've been hurt too bad in the past. Never to be a regular gardener. Five years ago, he knew he would never run a touchdown, but he firmly believed he could prune a fruit tree. To lose one's greatest dream is bad enough. 
to lose one's lesser dreams as well is far worse. But Mark is alive. He enjoys. He contributes. His heart beats. His spirit is strong. He believes in tomorrow. And although the last five years have battered him and bruised the gateway to his dream, there's fight in the young warrior still. I like being grown up. And it's a whole different world. In dealing with a head injury, you got to, you got to be strong. It's hard and as cruel as it is, that's the way it is. And so I'm going to beat it. Before his accident, Carlos Risker possessed a mind of extraordinary dexterity. As a scientist, he could leap from one abstract concept to another, find intricate relationships and patterns in nature, recognize order and symmetry in what others viewed as chaos. He was known for what his mind could do. Then suddenly, everything changed. As a result of the accident, Carlos lost his ability to understand and communicate the complexities of the physical universe. But in the five years since Carlos Risker left the transitional learning community, something remarkable has happened. Although his mind has lost its former gifts, he has gained unusual insight into the human experience. It's as if all that was superfluous was stripped away, leaving the clean, clear personality of a good and thoughtful man. So intriguing was this personality, was this new man, that Edna fell in love and they were married. I was wanting to meet someone special, a male that was someone special, you know, not just date somebody, you know, and I had pretty much stopped dating. And um, so when I met him, this was him, he, he, he's, he's himself. You know, he's, there's, there's no, like, facade or artificialness there. I saw a light on her face. I just stopped and recognized and saw how pretty she was, how pretty she is. But that I actually had not seen that originally. I saw her inner beauty. The beauty that I feel is a lot more important is the beauty of character. Edna Risker is a surgical nurse and has worked with head injury patients in the hospital setting. So she is aware of the silent deficits, memory loss, lack of concentration and focus, which sometimes torment her husband's mind. Few environments provide such a massive bombardment of impressions as the supermarket. Thousands upon thousands of messages requiring analysis, comparison and choice. Brands, sizes, colors, prices, coupons, specials, all demanding logical processing within the mind. It is a carnival of confusing sensation. Carlos is extremely vulnerable to distraction. When he and Edna are alone together, or with a few close friends, they are perfectly in tune, and his unique way of seeing things and expressing them make him a wonderful storyteller. But in public, a crowd, his thoughts flee, half expressed. He forgets, and he sometimes literally loses his way, can't find his way home. He usually keeps me in stitches, you know, which 
when he's out, he's a little more uptight about, you know, what could go wrong and uh, that he could say something that wasn't quite, you know, or they didn't get it or he didn't know how to explain something or he was telling a story and he left out the main part in the middle. You know, that happens out because the there's more stimuli and he's he's distracted. But when he's at home, he's focused. Something will something will pop up in in the in the course of real life, and uh, because that's because that thought is coincidental with something else, then I will tell I'll tell Edna about about that thing that that it's coincidental with. And, and she'll get on me, she'll say, you, you always, you said that before, about three times. My goals are now, break some of my own mental bondage, the whole thing of, of feeling that I can't do it, this or that. I do want to just unshackle all, all those things so that I know that I can go and do anything. Carlos and Edna have invited Carlos's father for dinner, Fred Risker. The entire Risker family has been enormously supportive throughout Carlos's long and difficult journey. Don't give up hope. And don't, don't give up. Just keep working, keep smiling. It's going to be hard, the road is hard, but nobody said it would be easy. But the end results is what you're looking for, see? Nearly a decade ago, Carlos was struck down at the very prime of life, and a long journey began. For a long while, his way was lost, but love came and stayed to light his path. And now, at last, it seems Carlos has found his way home. His name is David Rizik. When he was 19, a brilliant law student at Fordham University, he was one night attacked and beaten with an iron bar. His head crushed, he was left for dead. Within a few years, and after dozens of operations, he was physically healed, but there was something lost. He tried to go back to school, but failed. His concentration was gone. His thoughts were like a movie out of focus, a movie he cared not to see. He was rescued from his intellectual lassitudes by a unique program of therapy at New York University Medical Center. Eight years after his injury, David was able to get a job. Now, five more years have passed. David and his mother, Terry Rizik, still live together in Manhattan, sharing a high-rise, one-bedroom apartment. Two sensitive, highly intelligent, introspective people. Two powerful personalities, struggling to endure and to maintain their love for each other in a world much different than they ever dreamed. I don't want anything to happen to my children. I really don't want anything bad to happen. Mm. What do you know? I have to take it as it comes. How strong they seemed then, five years ago. We felt somehow their struggle was nearly over. For years, head injury had consumed their lives. It was the focus of all they said or did. There are many times when I feel that we are the two of us, like two beasts of burden, who are strapped to this goddamn cross, who just have to constantly struggle with no end in sight. And I wonder why. And then another part of me, a few days later or so, will, will suddenly have something neat happen, you know? Something nice happens in life all of the time. 
I think I still am, well, <laughs> I think I'm still struggling with David. I do want to work through that. That's has a lot to, to do with the growth I'm talking about, I have been talking about. Uh, frankly, now, I'm not sure the struggle ever ends, whether you'd be head injured or not. I wasn't able to protect him from everything. I could come and be the support person, you know, take care of everyday living and the expenses, etc. Um, but I don't think there's ever a point when anybody who's brain injured is really ready to tackle life. They just have to jump in and start doing it. And in retrospect, I'm glad that we had to do it this way. Because I think it's, it's helped David. It hasn't solved every problem, but there isn't a life that doesn't have problems. I have growing pains. And I don't like them, but I find I get through them. And after I get through the pain, I say, well, you know, I see after the fact, I've grown. And then I get uncomfortable. I say, oh boy, I'm about to grow. <laughs> how many adult ma males tell their mothers how they feel or what's going on in their lives? Do you? Well, see, that's perfectly normal. So I leave him alone for that. We try to live, we sort of like, you know, separate, separate lives. I do my things and he does his stuff. So when it's the fact that he's not doing much bothers me, I'm certain it bothers him too, because he, he will do it for a while and then he'll rally around and start doing something. This is something that David has to deal with himself. He has to live with himself, and he has to work out his life himself. I feel very strongly about that. I'm a pain in the neck in that I will always, I'm always around to pick up the pieces, you know? And, but I feel he'll be all right. I've got this gut feeling that I didn't have before. Getting my own place means a lot to me, and I think it will help me very much. I think it's overdue. by my clock, although looking back, now might have been a be is a better time. I'm more prepared and I think I know why I want to go off. I can do things, do more for myself then. And that's how I learned to cope with the new David, which is still David, nonetheless. And if I, you know, if I separate the two Davids, I'm 11 years old, and I'm not 11 years old. I'm still in here. A friend of mine, fr uh, hadn't seen him well, said, you know what's nice? David's back. If he were still handsome and were a successful lawyer, you know, I'd be proud of him. But I'm infinitely prouder of him now because he's had so much to overcome. So many things that were so very difficult for him. Well, despite what happens, life goes on and so does mine. I mean, actually, from a layman standpoint, actually, I'm fine. I'm haunted, possibly, and that might go on. Hopefully not forever, and it just might. A young man and his mother talk of many things. Life, growing old, coping with insecurity, the search for self, fear of failure, and fear of success. They talk of work and school, the problems of living alone, of love and guilt and resentment and taking out the trash. They mourn the past and welcome the future.
They talk of these things, Terry and David. And the extraordinary thing is, so do we all. They speak the language of the human family. The concerns that fill their minds are those that bless and plague us all. So how much farther can their journey be? Four young men living lives of heroic proportion, each on a voyage of discovery. No two journeys are the same. They travel at different speeds, along differing routes to destinations whose names no one knows. But we do know this. Their journey reveals to all of us what is most beautiful in each of us. The will to endure. The capacity to fight the darkness that would surround us. The strength of spirit to pursue the light. We are the living. We are the living. We live, feel dawn, see sunsets glow. We live, feel dawn, see sunsets glow. Love and are loved. Love and are loved. A long way from Flanders fields. A long way from Flanders fields. <laughs>